I love that. We're cheering. We're cheering for God. Amen, church. He's the only one who can do that. So keep going, Lord. Keep going. And that's the gospel advancing. That's the fruit of the gospel in our lives and in our church. And as dark as our world is, you can't stop Jesus Christ. I need to thank him for that and praise him for that. I pray that you would join me as I do that right now. Father, we do praise you. We just, we worship you and say, who else can get glory of one life changed after another other than you? You're it. You're the one. Jesus Christ, you're the one. Holy Spirit of God, you are the one. Three in one, the Trinity. Oh, God, Father Almighty, we just love you so much and asking that you be working in our midst now, Lord, in a challenging message before us, but all in the purposes of what we just saw, Lord, the reality that you are moving forward and you are calling people to yourself at a cost, at a reward. So, Lord, would you speak powerfully today? Lord, I just um, especially burdened even for those who are here right now and who will struggle, Lord, with this message. I just pray that you will, by your grace, you will prepare them in their hearts to not fight, but to surrender. Lord, do that with me. Do that with me as I struggle, Lord, in the truths that you present. And yet I believe in my heart, Lord, by the Spirit of God, it's right. I cannot argue with what you say. And I know that is the greatest path to joy, even though it comes at a cost to us. That's the whole point, isn't it, Lord Jesus? You gave everything to us with your life that we then in turn would say, and here's my everything for you, Jesus. So use this now, Lord. Many people need to hear this, this truth at this time. And we just say, oh God, oh God, speak and give grace and, and, and conviction, but also at the same time, as only you can, tremendous encouragement. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. A quick update on Nepal. Uh, we are giving $10,000 to the Samaritan's Purse in the relief um, for the people, humanitarian aid, but also for the gospel as a church. Uh, some of you, many of you, desire to contribute to this as you desire to see people cared for in this way. On our website, there's a front page link if you desire to donate to the causes as we continue this week now to see how we can work directly with our churches, Harvest Bible Chapels that are in Nepal. And we're just trying to find out the best way to do that to make sure the money gets to where it's intended. It's one of the great challenges with missions in certain places like Nepal is to make sure as you send it, you can trust the sources as to where it's going and set up in the proper organization. So, if you desire to give to that on our website or on an envelope today, and your heart's burdened for that, for the people, for the gospel there, you can just indicate it on the envelope in Nepal, and then we will make sure that that gets there as well. But we are excited to uh, initially donate 10000 and to see where that goes as well. And as it is, makes sense, we will continue to update you as a church, as a whole, too. All right, week number two in our series here. And uh, here's what our series is called on the screen beside me. Here it is. Look at that. Nuts for Jesus. Yeah. All right, I think the 11:15 service got that the most out of the three, because if you were here last week, you should remember that. If you weren't here last week, you think I'm nuts right now, all right? But that's okay. At the very least, I got your attention. But what's amazing within this series in the gospel, as we live it out, the world will think we're crazy at times. I mean, the Bible promises that. You're out of your mind, and we've lost our mind for Jesus. In a sense, amen. We're not expecting those without the Spirit of God to be able to discern the things that are of the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 2.14. And so that's why in part of this series, it's a very accurate title. But here's the real title for the series. Gospel Advance, Taking the Gospel, Shining the Light Within the Darkness, the Commission Christ Has Placed Upon Us. I've been encouraged this this week. Many people have come up to me and said, you know, the Lord and the truth of his word, the conviction by his Holy Spirit has brought me to a place. I had had to go out and share the message of Christ. I just had to do it. And I pray you were also like me, thinking and praying and burdened with the desire to speak the love of Jesus Christ. And the key is now, though, not just for a week, but the key is for our lives to be renewed in our minds as to what's most important. Importance. Let me remind you as to the goal for this series. The goal is to reinvigorate our passion for the gospel, which leads to our purpose in the gospel, which leads to our perspective in the gospel. It's going to happen today. A lot of perspectives going to come today, Lord willing, in God's word through the gospel. This is our goal. We're, we're gathering on the same page here. Here's the outline for our series as well. Last week, the gospel is my purpose. We've got to share it. We've got to share it. Paul, I've appointed you for this purpose, Jesus says, to take this gospel. Today, the gospel comes at a cost. You've got to count it. It's today. It's going to be tough for some, but it's going to be right for all. And thirdly, next week, Lord willing, Pastor Craig, the gospel can't be stopped, and we've got to love it. But here we are today. The gospel can't 
or it must be counted. The gospel comes at a cost. We've got to count it. And uh, for that, let's get our Bibles open to Luke chapter 14, uh, verse 25. Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Make sure the person beside you has a Bible. And uh, we can encourage each other in that. That'd be so great too. I'm going to start in verse 25 today, which makes sense. Um, because that is a great intro, very telling intro to our passage and theme today. Luke 14, verse 25 says this, Now great crowds accompanied him, that's Jesus, and Jesus turned and said to them. So notice first of all in our context that great crowds accompanied Jesus. Now for any Bible teacher, this is a pretty good sign. It's a good sign, right? you got a lot of people showing up. There seems to be, you know, a lot of attention, a lot of momentum, and seemingly there's a great opportunity to continue to teach truth, right? And maybe to enhance the crowd further, to get more people in on the circle of this rabbi called Jesus. So you'd think this opportunity was amazing, right? Well, in the case of Jesus, the answer is sort of. There was an opportunity here for sure for Jesus, but maybe not the opportunity that one might expect. I want you to see what Jesus does as the crowds close in. The text says in verse 25 that he turned to them and said. Said what? That's verse 26. Take a look. He said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters... Yes, even hate, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I'm always exhorting you, live in the text, live in the text, live in the text, okay? So imagine you're one of Jesus' disciples. You're there for sure. One of his 12, and you're following along. And if you're one of the disciples, you see all the crowds gathering, and you're like, yeah, this is going great, man. I was a fisherman, a nobody. I was a task, task I, I was despised. But now I'm in the inner circle of Jesus, and here we are. And, and look at the rabbi rock the house. Look at him go, man. He is gathering this group of people, and people are excited, and so much attention. He's performing miracles. I mean, this is so great. And so just imagine being one of those 12, but then you hear hear the words come out of Jesus' mouth in verse 26. Tell me this, as a disciple, what are you thinking honestly? Because your idea of the kingdom is different than Jesus' idea. You're going to find that out as time goes on. What are you thinking? Jesus says, verse, if anyone does not hate his own father and mother, brothers and sisters, children, yes, even, I mean, you're like, Peter, did he just say what I think he said? Peter, did, did you hear that? Am I making this stuff up? Or did he just say, what kind of face are you articulating it? What kind of face are you making as Jesus says, verse 26, you're all excited, all the crowds, and then you're like, what? And you're, did he, did he just say that? And you're just kind of confused because, again, this is, this is not the way you would have drawn it up. Let's be clear about Jesus, loved ones. This isn't really good PR. It just isn't. If you're trying to sustain a crowd, you don't come up with the stuff that he just did. Let's be sure of this, too. Jesus was not a very good politician, Praise the Lord for that. Amen, church. Amen. Right? Right? Because the politician would never do this. I mean, he's cutting the line down the middle, or even worse, and he's setting it straight on what he says are the demands for someone who's truly going to follow him. It's interesting to me that as the crowds got their biggest, Jesus often brought his hardest. And let's be clear also, this little sermon by Jesus would not grow the church. Most likely it would shrink it. That's the same for this message. I don't expect this message today to grow this church. But let's be very clear, the message that Jesus gave in this passage would strengthen his church. And I believe that our church will be strengthened as well today from this message. Because what Jesus does, he brings a message of cost He brings a message of suffering. He ultimately brings a message of dying to self. Why? Well, it's the same reason that a goldsmith heats up gold. And the more heat that intensifies the gold, the impurities will rise to the top. And therefore, the goldsmith can sweep out the impurities, thereby leaving the gold more pure than when it first started off. Jesus knows this. When the true message of the gospel, the message of cost, the message of suffering, the message of dying to self, which is undeniably in the word of God over and over again, which is a critical part of the gospel, Jesus knows 
as the cost settles in, the impurities from our lives as individuals, the impurities of a church as a whole, it rises to the top. Those who are false will not make it. Those who are false will be proven to be false. They are skimmed off the top. And even within our own lives as genuine believers, we find out what we're really made of. We find out in the midst of the cost of suffering and the death to self who we really are before Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus brings messages like this. Because it challenges us and it shows us again who we really are and what we really believe. Jesus was not into spiritual hype, but Jesus was into spiritual health. And nothing has changed. Loved ones, part of what we must know, and, and I just ask you to look here for a second. You've got to know this. As a follower of Jesus Christ, I pray you know, listen, this isn't getting any easier. I hope you understand that. All the signs are indicating that to truly follow Christ. I'm not talking about half-hearted, lukewarm, nominal, I say one thing, I do another Christian. I'm talking about if you're actually going to live for Jesus Christ, I need you to know it's not getting any easier but it is going to get a whole lot better. And that's only what the Lord can do with his gospel. Even in the midst of suffering, the greatest joy awaits us. Even in the midst of a great cost of self, the greatest delight and the power of God and the blood. You think God's limited by opposition? He works within that. But you got to know, if you're really going to go for Jesus Christ, you and I, it's not going to get easier. But it is going to get way, way better. So one of the things you and I will be tempted with within the message today, as you hear certain things, you'll be tempted with fear. My prayer is instead of fear, as I am tempted with as well, but you will turn to faith. My God is sovereign. My God is in control. My God has made me a child of God. My God cannot lose. I belong to him. Any suffering I go through in this life is temporal. I live for what is eternal. Therefore, I do not fear. I trust and I fight with faith. And the God who loves me, who cares for me, who knows me, who has saved me, and will never, ever let me go. Not fear today, loved ones. Faith. What kind of cost are we talking about? First is this, a cost of self. If you're going to follow Christ wholeheartedly, you've got to know there's going to be a cost of self. Again, look at verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. What a profound teaching this is from Jesus here. Notice the word hate in verse 26, but realize really what Jesus is teaching is love, love for him, love for Christ. Jesus is not teaching us to outright hate people in our lives. Hate here was a Semitic expression of loving less. I mean, we know that because our selves are included in verse 26. Yes, he even doesn't hate his own self, cannot be my disciple. What he's teaching here in this text is that our love for him is to be so strong and powerful that in comparison, nothing and no one else really does compare. Just this week, some of you came up to me and told me my love for Jesus Christ has caused my earthly father to disown me. What is that? That is verse 26. At the end of the day, this individual is loving Christ more than the temporal love of his earthly father. He wants to love his earthly father, but at the end of the day, his love for Christ is more, even as it relates to him, that his mother and father are disowning him for his passion for Christ. Literally this week, some of you came up to me and says, there, there, there are, there's tension in my marriage now with my spouse because of my love for Jesus Christ. What is that? That's verse 26. It's not that they're not trying to love, they are loving their spouse, but because of their love for Jesus Christ, their spouse is hostile to their faith. It creates a difficulty in the home. That's verse 26. Some of you this week, this all happened this week, it's amazing. Some of you came up and said, I had friends before Christ that I no longer have after Christ because of my relationship with Christ. What is that? That's verse 26. What Jesus is saying, he's saying is, if you do not love me more than anything and anyone else, if you capitulate in a relationship to your earthly father over me, then he says, you don't get the gospel. The person who loves horizontal relationships more than the, the one vertical relationship with Jesus Christ, that person doesn't understand the gospel. 
Because if you really understand the gospel of Christ, you have everything in Christ, you are everything in Christ, and in the end of the day, you need nothing else apart from Christ. That's just the truth presented in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you have everything in Him, vertically, then everything horizontally in comparison will pale. This is what Jesus is saying in verse 26. But the last part is the most important, verse 26. He says, yes, hate even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. Now, step back far enough from what Jesus just said. Who can demand such devotion? If you don't love me more than everything else, you can't be my disciple. Who, can de- who is worthy of such devotion? There's only one who's worthy of that, God himself. Only God can demand such things from one who is perfect in all things. See, the key is, if you found the all in all, Christ, then you don't need anything else. Again, that's what Jesus is saying. So he is worthy of demanding such devotion. But let's be clear here in this text. The gospel is a call to death. A gospel is a call to death of self and then life in Christ. And that's why, loved ones, think about it. The call to death in self, that's hard. Our flesh hates that. The Spirit of God within us loves it. But the call to death in self, that's why Jesus says in Matthew 7 that the wide is road and easy that many find. That leads to destruction. But the, the road is wide. and it's You know, there are, there are many people sitting in churches right now, right now in this nation, who are on the wide and easy road because ultimately they've never died to self. They've never fully surrendered to Jesus Christ. They've never truly counted the cross, uh, cost of him being all and them being secondary. So they have intellectually an agreement with something biblical. They might do some good works to make themselves feel better than being better than the person beside them, but they've never surrendered truly in faith. They don't truly know Jesus Christ and they are on the wide and easy road, which is the road their flesh wants, and they are actually living apart from Jesus Christ. Do you know there are people in this room in the same place? I have no idea who they are, but the Lord does. There always is in a room this size. There are people in this room right now. You are on the wide and easy road because you've never fully surrendered to Jesus Christ. He's never fully been on the throne. And therefore, life is actually about you as opposed to Christ. Why? Because it's easier. It's just flat out easier. But Jesus says that's the road that leads to destruction. That's why he also says, though, that narrow is the road and hard, his words, hard that leads to life. You find it because it is hard because it's not about us. But you see, any gospel that is pure and any gospel is true is a gospel that is preaching death to self but life in Jesus Christ. Here's what I know. Even as I preach this verse, there's a battle going on right now. Even through verses 25 and 26, even right now, our flesh fights against this. How do I know? Because my flesh fights against it. But the Spirit of God within us is saying, no, no, this is right, this is right. But there's a battle going on. Some of us don't like this truth. Why? Because in the end of the day, we don't want death to self. We want life to self. We want ease, comfort, and safety. We want pleasure. You say, Robbie, how do you know that? Because my flesh wants ease, comfort, safety, and pleasure. That's how I know. And so my flesh within me is like, no, don't listen to Jesus. Don't listen. But the Spirit of God within me is like, yeah, listen, listen, listen. Preach it, preach it. And surrender to it. Because that's where life is truly found. My flesh wants things contrary to the Spirit. The Spirit of God within me wants exactly what is in this word here today. You see, and this is why there are so many false gospels in our life. Think about it, think about it. Just, just again, wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. Any gospel that is apart from this call to death to self and life to Christ is a false gospel. So a false gospel, the gospel of prosperity, that's a false gospel. Why? Because ultimately, a gospel of prosperity says Jesus died so you can be rich. Really? Where's that in Scripture? Nowhere. Nowhere. Right? It completely contradicts our text today. Completely. Not to mention several other ones. And what happens? The gospel of prosperity, we are in the center, and Jesus died to glorify us, as opposed to us living to glorify him. That is a false gospel. That's just not in the Bible. A gospel of health, that Jesus died to save us from any form of pain and suffering and trial, and everything we go through. I believe Jesus heals, I believe that, but I also believe that Jesus and God allows lots of things to happen. Not every Christian gets healed. So are we lacking faith? No, no, no. We're lacking good theology if we believe that. That's a false 
gospel. There was a book written about 10 years ago. We might have heard of it. It's called Your Best Life Now. If you look at the contents of that book by Joel Osteen, the center of that book is humanity, not Jesus Christ. It just is. I'm not intentionally trying to offend people. If you don't know this, you have to know this. Inherently within that book, it's a false gospel. It's not about Christ. There's no mention of sin. There's no cost or death to self. Again, it completely contradicts our passage today. A lot of biblical language. A nice guy giving the message. Just because you're a nice guy doesn't mean anything. I mean, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light all the time. I'm not trying to judge an individual. I'm trying to judge the words, though, he's written down. Any gospel that puts us in the center is a false gospel gospel and the dangerous part about this is that if you have a false gospel false gospels lead us away from jesus christ if you're being led away from jesus christ know this you're being led to hell you can't you you can't go away from christ and stay in heaven and be in the purity of of the truth if you're going away from jesus christ you're going away from everything he is he's life he's joy he's salvation and so if you're going away from him in a false gospel that's what's so subtle about the enemy and the satanic origins of so many of these teachings. It sounds good. It seems to be right. It makes me feel better. But in the end of the day, leading people away from true repentance, true death to self, and true life in Jesus Christ. God help us to see that. But this is why Paul says in Galatians 1, and I love his humility, he says, but if we, if we or an angel should preach any gospel contrary to the one that we gave to you, the one that we received from Christ, the one we preach, he says, let him be accursed. Again, he says, he says, he says, hey, church in Galatia, if I preach to you a gospel contrary to the one I received from Jesus Christ, if I or an angel should say something, let us be accursed. And just in case you didn't get it, in the very next verse, he says the very same thing again. Let him be accursed. That's how serious this is. The gospel comes at a cost. The loved ones, make sure you know that the moment we understand the cost and we die to self is the moment we actually start to live for him. And, and this could be your answer today. Maybe your answer today is because we've never truly surrendered to Jesus Christ fully, that that's why we've never been really been able to fully live. The life that we see in others, even in the baptism video, the life that we your testament we're just like i don't i've never understood how that's because we've never fully surrendered our lives to christ and so we're not willing to die to self therefore we're not willing to live in christ but see there's the opportunity today which is so so exciting john 12 verse 24 says this check this out jesus says truly truly i say to you unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies i, I love jesus of course knowing everything he uses the metaphor the example of a kernel of wheat a kernel of wheat is tiny little thing if it if it falls to the ground and doesn't die so it just remains by itself there's no fruit he says it remains alone but if it dies it bears much fruit so a kernel of wheat this little tiny thing like not much bigger than a like a grain of rice if it falls on the ground and then dies it opens up it, it cracks it explodes and literally there are thousands of opportunities for seed for grain that comes from that one kernel of wheat how smart is jesus say eh? he used the example if you die you crack open and you explode from your life because because you become nothing christ because christ fills you christ lives in you but if you don't die to self there's no christ in you it's just you and you and me on our own we're nothing but with Christ in us, the potential then for everything. So as we die to self, the life of Christ explodes from us, has the potential for hundreds of yields of fruit for our lives. So Jesus says, whoever loves his life, loses it. Who refuses to die, refuses to live. But whoever hates his life, whoever dies, who breaks open in this world, will keep it for eternal life. But the cost of self is so, so important. The gospel comes at a cost. And when we die to self and we start to see the life, it's just the way it goes. It's always been that way. And it's that way today too. Secondly, this, we see the, the cost of suffering. The cost of suffering. So the ear-tickling sermon of Jesus continues. Not, all right? But look at verse 27. He says, 
Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot me be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his, his own cross, notice. Um, okay, the moment the disciples or the people there under Roman rule, the moment they hear cross, they think death. They hear take up cross and they think instrument of torture, instrument of humiliation, instrument of loneliness. If you're gonna pick up your cross, you're not coming back. You know what I'm saying? Like you're going one way and you're not coming back. That's what they're understanding as they hear these things. Jesus spoke these words 2,000 years ago, and the early church would find out pretty quickly what he meant by this, because they would actually, many of them would actually die on a cross in this way. What about us? Us in our, in our nation at this time, we have been raised in a historically uh, Christian society. Our nation was founded on principles of the word of God and the values that are found within a Christian nation. No one can deny that on some level or another. We have experienced, because of that, a profound blessing of peace and freedom and grace, which we still harvest to death. As I walked into the church earlier this morning, I was just like, God, thank you. I mean, in light of all this, I'm just, thank you that we have a place to meet. Thank you that we can show up and park our cars and walk in. Thank you that there's nothing preventing us from Thank you I can open up the word and declare the truth. Thank you that we have the, the grace to sing songs and openly worship you. Thank you we can invite people to come in and join us. Thank you we can pray. I mean, just not taking those things for granted. But what we do know, if you have any sense of what's happening in our world, you know that things are changing. And you know that many brothers and sisters, millions of brothers and sisters in Christ across this world, do not have anywhere near the same freedoms that we do at this time. Listen to these stats in the persecuted church here coming from Open Doors uh, Ministry, specializes in the persecuted church. More Christians were martyred in the 20th century than in all other centuries combined. Over 75% of the world's population lives in areas with severe religious restrictions. 75% of the world's population lives in such areas. Christians are the most widely persecuted religious group in the world. 75% of acts of religious intolerance are directed against Christians. 75%. According to the United States Department of State, Christians in more than 60 countries face persecution from their governments or surrounding neighbors simply because of their belief in Jesus Christ. Currently, over 100 million Christians are being persecuted worldwide. The number one persecutor of Christians is North Korea where an estimated 50,000 to 70,000 Christians are imprisoned in labor camps. China has experienced a 300% increase in abuse and persecution against Chinese Christians just since 2013. More than 70% of Christians have fled Iraq since 2003. 70%, if not way more. 700,000 Christians have left Syria since the Civil War began in 2011. The most rapidly growing area of persecution in the World Watch list are in the countries of Africa, especially in the sub-Saharan part of Africa. Islamic extremism is by far the most significant persecution engine. 40 of the 50 countries on the World Watch list are affected by extreme Islamic persecution against Christians. 2014 experienced the highest level of global persecution of Christians in the modern era. 2014, the highest level of global persecution in the modern era. And they say 2015, the current conditions of 2015 suggest that the worst is yet to come. Here's a map on the screen for you of the areas of the church that is persecuted. The red is extreme persecution. The red is essentially, if you're a Christian, you die. They had their way. Yellow is severe persecution. Green is moderate. And blue is sparse. Look at, look at again, 75% of the world, 70% of the world's population exists in these areas. I mean, that's astounding. This is what's happening right now. This is, this is, and, I mean, it's not like Europe is a, you know, great place. And I don't, I don't think this is getting better. We know as Christians that even in our society here that suffering is getting closer and closer to home if you're really going to live for Jesus Christ. We know that the name of Jesus has never been more under attack. 
We know that agendas are all over the place. They're all over the place, specifically against Christ, against his church, against his word, against evangelical churches. We know that subtle persecution is ever increasing in the form of intolerance, verbal attacks, legal activities, and subtle is growing into not so subtle. We know that entire forms of government are closing in on religious liberty and freedom, specifically targeting Christians. We know the increasing satanic hatred for Christ is becoming more and more obvious. We know the flavor of the Antichrist is growing with each day. And that's what it is. It's the Antichrist. It's not anti-Buddha. It's not anti-Muhammad. It's Antichrist. Listen, loved ones. Listen, listen, listen. Just as Jesus promised. See, that's the key. It's not like this is catching us off guard. At least it shouldn't. If you know your Bible, you know what Jesus said. And loved ones, I say that. And as I say that, some of us right now are tempted with fear. We're tempted with fear. But be not afraid. Be not afraid. Be prepared. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to prepare you with what Jesus has so clearly said. Now, when I think about the realities of the world that we're living in right now, you know what this does for me? For me, when I allow my faith to replace certain aspects of fear, what it does for me, it lessens my grip on the world and increases my grip on the word. That's what it does. It just heightens the intensity and passion for what matters. It lessens my passion for earth and heightens my passion for eternity. It diminishes my desire for self and intenses my love for the Savior. It causes me to care less about me and it causes me to increase in my love for the gospel and for those who need to hear it and who are dying without it. Again, hear me, I'm not trying to be an alarmist today, but I am trying to teach you the Bible. And this is what the Bible says. And I want you, like I'm having conversations with my children right now. My son who's 10, my other son who's 8, my daughter who's 5, my other daughter who's 3, and having conversations appropriate to where they are, but just helping them understand, listen, listen, if you're really going to live for Jesus Christ, you've got to know it's going to come at a cost. Again, I'm not talking about the lukewarm, I attend church a couple of times a year, but it has no fruit in my life. You're fine, man, you're totally safe. No one's going to touch you, because there's nothing happening in your life. But for the person who's actually going to stand for the cause and the call and the gospel of Jesus, who's going to love him and do it with, with compassion and gentleness and humility. We're not, we're not trying to bring on persecution, but just in the nature of you're really going to live for Jesus Christ. Son, I said, my son, you have to aid and you, you got to know it's, it's not going to mean, I tell you, his face, his face changes when I say that to him. Like he knows enough that he, He's just trying to wrestle. What does that mean? I, 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 don't, I don't know what it means exactly. So I, I just know, though, that to live for... It's, it's not like when I was a kid. It's changed that much. In 30 years, it's just changed that much. Hey, son, but let's not be afraid. Our God is awesome. He holds everything. He is sovereign. He has promised he'll be with us. And how exciting it is. How exciting... Live in a time... What if the church took hold of the reality of what it means to truly live for him? Back to our text, look at verse 28. And here he goes, right? This is what he's saying. For which one of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? There it is. Whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to to finish so amazing here notice jesus is 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 front-loading he's not trying to hide the reality of what's going in fact he's front-loading hey 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 count the cost the crowds are gathering in and he's like hey listen up listen up. you better know what you're walking into right now you really want to follow me you're not just here for a free meal you really want to follow me count the cost he's like count the cost he's not into half-hearted lukewarm believers He's into quality, not quantity. You know I'm convinced too how afraid Satan is, that Satan is of this particular series and message. Why? Because what if the church actually woke up? Like what if the church actually woke up? What if we actually began to see with spiritual eyes? What if when the opposition increased and all of a sudden it brought a crystal clear vision and passion and focus upon our lives? You know when you're sitting there and you're casually sitting down enjoying the day and nothing wrong with that, but you're just kind of enjoying life, sipping a cup of coffee with some friends, but then the phone rings 
or a text or someone comes up and crisis hits, many of us have lived through that more than once with a child or a friend and we're there just enjoying the moment and all of a sudden information is received, someone's in trouble, 911, whatever it is, and the instant that takes place, mind instantly renewed, a seriousness instantly upon us, passion instantly set ablaze, adrenaline instantly starts to flow. There is no distraction. It is an undivided attention on the task at hand and the crisis that needs your care and help. This is what happens when opposition is found upon the church and we recognize what is really at stake. The distractions go away. The clarity comes in. This is why the, I remember a pastor in a severely part of persecuted church in China, he said, I remember him saying this, I feel sorry for you in the West. Why, pastor from China under severe, how could you, he says, I feel sorry for you because you're not persecuted. You don't have the blessings and the riches that come with persecution as it purifies the church. So this is one of the things that happens. When the cost is seen and all of a sudden the urgency sets in. And just think about that too in those moments of crisis and the opposition arises. You know what we don't have time for? I love this so much too. Because the gospel is so in front of us and the urgency is, you know men, women, you know what you don't have time for in these moments? Hey men, you don't have time for pornography. Lives are at stake. There's no time to sit around wasting our lives in sin. That's part of the problem with our society and our church. We're so bored with our busyness. We're so inactive that we're sitting around finding ways to sin all the time. But when the urgency comes in and the opposition is there, there's no time for pornography in the church. You know, it breaks my heart, kills me. How much infighting there is in the church over the years. But when the opposition comes and the cost is there and the urgency is there, there's no time to fight over e- with each other over the color of the carpet in the church, which literally happens. There's no time to, to face each other with arguments of what worship style we like. That's ridiculous. In, in, the, in the cause of the gospel and the urgency, you're just glad to be able to sing a song at all, let alone fight with each other over which style of music is more preferred. Really? That to me, in light of eternity and lives going to hell, that is pathetic. I have no time for that. I have no time to fight with each other about things of temporal that have no value whatsoever. I have no time. There's too much to do. There's too much passion to be placed in things that actually matter than appeasing to someone's pride so that they can be the center of attention. Help us, God. Help us. There's no time for vanity in these moments. There's no time for materialism when the opposition comes in and the gospel is at stake and to preach this, you don't have time to say, oh, I wish I had a better car, better car, better car, when you're just like, man, I want the person to have life. Don't you see why suffering can be one of the greatest things that ever happens to the church? Because all of a sudden we start to live for what actually we're called to live for. I want you to see this, man, the simplicity that comes in so quickly, the seriousness that sets in, the passion that is found all of a sudden, not for the world, but for the word, not for the earth, but for the Savior. We had a prayer meeting coming up May 13th. We said that. We had a prayer meeting coming up on May 13th. We got a prayer meeting coming up on May 13th. And you know what we're doing? We're praying for our future. Like, I'm dead serious. The elders, we're just like, we're praying for the future of our church. God, what do you want to do through this church at this time in our world? What do you want to do? We're praying for our future. God, what about this building? Should we expand or not expand? Is that something you want to do or not do for the cause of the gospel? Is that important or unimportant? What do we do, Lord? We're running out of room within this place. What do we do with the gospel? How do we be most effective in our land? What do you, what kind of ministries? What, how many churches? Lord, we need your help. Would you, would you join us? We want to pray for our future. God, help us. Did I mention it's May 13th? Hey, if you care about this church, you will be there. I'm dead serious. If you care about this church, you will be at this prayer meeting because it involves you as well. I'm going to pray right through this series. How does the gospel advance? God help us. God show us. God lead us. Notice the example given by Jesus in in verse 29. Notice he includes the people who don't count the cost in building the tower. They get mocked when the building is unfinished. See, inherently, this is what happens. The world... The world mocks the half-hearted Christian. The world mocks... I've seen this hundreds of times. 
I profess to know Christ, I profess to know Christ, life gets hard, I give up on Christ, I give up on Christ. And the world trips her and says, yeah, I knew you were fake, that was just a phase. It's just a phase, he's not the real deal. See, all that, all that Jesus stuff, that was, never, that was never, and they chirp in and they mock. That's why Jesus says, hey, listen, you're gonna do this, count the cost. You're gonna do this, young man, count the cost. You're gonna do this? He's, he's not trying to trick us. He's like, listen, it's gonna be tough, it's gonna be awesome. It's gonna come at a cost to sell, but you get me, he says, awesome. He says, it's gonna be heartache, but it's gonna be joy, but you gotta count the cost. Because you're gonna start this journey, you gotta finish it. And those who are real do and will. The cost of self, the cost of suffering, and thirdly and finally this, the cost of sacrifice. Verse 33, Jesus says, so therefore any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. So if there's any question regarding the call for complete commitment in this passage, those questions are now answered. Jesus says, anyone who does not renounce all that he has. Renounce carries the idea of this, saying goodbye to. So it means I don't trust in self and stuff. I trust in Savior. I trust in Christ. I, I am willing to say goodbye to that because I have everything. You say, how can I live this way? How is, that, how is it possible to live in the renunciation of all that I have? Well, here's how it's possible. Paul has the secret in Philippians 3. In Philippians 3, Paul says, I count all things as lost. That's I renounce all that I have. I consider them rubbish. I consider them dung, the text says technically. I consider that lost. How, Paul? How? When compared to the surpassing worth, value, treasure of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Did you, did you hear that? Do you understand that? So Paul says, I can count all things as loss when compared to the treasure of the gospel of my life in Jesus Christ. It's the same point in the parable of the hidden treasure. Jesus tells the parable of the man walking along in a field, stumbles upon this treasure. He sees the treasure. He instantly understands its value. The greatest thing he's ever seen. Nothing can compare with this treasure. He leaves it. He sells all that he has. So he has the money to buy the field because when he buys the field, he has the treasure. Now notice what's happening in that parable of the hidden treasure. He finds the treasure. It's infinite value. Instantly, it's the value of the treasure that fills him with joy. The value of the treasure fills him with joy and the joy then leads him to sacrifice. Don't you see? But it's not a sacrifice of like, oh, fine, I'll do it. Like a kid, hey, can you empty the dishwasher? Fine, I'll do it. It's not like that at all, right? It's like, do I have to? Oh, it's, like, it's like, I get you. When you have everything, you need nothing. Do you see? Do you see the power of the gospel? The treasure of Jesus Christ? When I have received infinite eternal worth in Christ, what does that new piece of clothing mean to me? Boop. It means this. Compared to, now, the car and the clothing in the house, that's not bad, but it has no value in the end of eternity, especially when compared to Jesus Christ. That's the secret to living this way. You don't care about the cost and the suffering because you've already been given everything. You've cashed in on Jesus, understand? Right? He's given you everything. So therefore, who cares about ABCD? That's Paul's secret. That's what Jesus is commending. That's what we are called to do as well. But see, that's when cost, it, it's not trying harder. It's accepting the love more of what Jesus has done. Now, look at verse 31. Just don't want to skip over this. He says, or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and he asks for terms of peace. Now, very interesting, okay? The first parable of the tower could be sit down and count the cost of following Christ. The second parable could be this, sit down and count the cost of not following Christ. You see, the first one is count the cost of following Christ. The second one is count the cost of not, because if you go up against an army that has double your soldiers, 10,000, 20,000, 2 million, whatever, especially if you're going against God, you lose. So, so hear this. In light of the temporal cost of following Jesus Christ, hear this, loved ones, hear this. This is the greater cost is rejecting Jesus Christ himself. Because the cost of rejecting Jesus Christ is eternal. 
eternity. The cost of following Christ now is temporal. The moment we die, we're good. We're good. But those without, if you're here today, the cost, if you're apart from Jesus Christ, the cost of rejecting Jesus. I mean, some of us are like, man, live at a cost for Christ in this world, and it's going to be so tough, and sometimes it is. But when compared to the eternal cost of rejecting the offer of salvation through Christ, that is the true cost. That is the one that hits the hardest. You know, there are credible reports that say that hundreds of Christians die every day for their faith in Jesus Christ across this world. Either dozens, some say dozens, and some even say a few hundred every day die for the gospel of Jesus Christ. This month's issue of Voice of the Martyrs is entitled this, We Only Die Once, We Might As Well Die for Jesus. Isn't, isn't, that, isn't that true, though? We only die once. So if you're going to die... Might as well die for, what are we holding on to otherwise? These are, these are things I'm really, really wrestling with in a renewed sense of purity and love before the Lord right now. And just say, Lord, where am I really at? Where's my heart really at? Who am I really? Would you help me with this, oh God? You know, there's a story of a, a missionary called Graham Stewart Staines. He was an Australian Christian missionary who ministered to lepers in India. Born in 1941, visited India for the first time in 1965, met his wife Gladys in 81, was married in 83. They had three children, um, Esther, a daughter, sons, Philip and Timothy. Uh, Staines was used to translate the Bible into a very unique language, the language of, of, of whole in uh, India. He proofreaded the entire New Testament manuscript, but his primary ministry was ministering to the lepers. He spoke fluent Oriya, which was the local language, very well loved by the lepers there. He used to help and see some of them cured. He would teach them how to make practical things like mats out of rope and basket from saboy grass and hand weaving. So here is this man who lived for Christ in helping and loving the unlovable, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and practically. And yet here's what happened on January 22nd of 1999, I could have told stories of more recent. Honestly, they're too graphic to share right now. Um, Staines had attended a jungle camp, an annual gathering of Christians of the area to strengthen fellowship and for teaching. In the night, he was sleeping in a station wagon with his two sons. Again, a Philip, age 10, and Timothy, age 6. The station wagon was set afire by a Hindu mob and Graham and his two sons, Philip and Timothy, they were burnt alive and their charred bodies were found embracing each other. Why? They were loving, they were loving people that the very culture around them in the Hindu, they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. They're just trying to love people. And I love Jesus, helping people. It's because they love Jesus. I got a 10-year-old. I got an 8-year-old. Can you imagine? You know, the, the guy who wrote this post, he says, Graham Staines lost his life, but he did not waste it. And he says, writing that you may not waste yours writing that you may not waste yours. Here's the, here's the power of the truth of a Christian serving Christ and losing their life here, John 12. Notice, Jesus says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. That's very powerful to live that way. You can kill me, you can't take my soul. You can't. Every Christian genuinely saved in Jesus Christ, this is the power. But notice what Jesus says, but I will warn you whom to fear. This is who you really should fear. Fear him who after he has killed has the authority. So that's what it comes down to. Has the authority. Look at Jesus, man. He's not, he's, he's not mixing words. Has the authority to cast him to hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Who's him? Jesus. He has the authority over all of eternity of life and death. See, this gives us such great hope. Grandstein's lost his life, but he didn't, he didn't really Either did his sons. It's amazing. It's powerful. So in a message like this, and I know it's tough, say, where do we go from here? 
I have uh, six things I wrote down of what do we do with a message like this? How do we live in light of this truth? I take some time because it's just, it's just, it's just too important. I mean, this, this is so much a part of the Christian life that we need to be living in. First of all, pray effectively. It's the gospel. Pray according to the gospel. Okay, so I'm not going to condemn you for praying for ingrown toenails. I just think there's a higher level of prayer that can probably be offered to the Lord in light of people being sent to hell and death and all sorts of things. And just to pray with an urgency. Are our prayers just focused on self or are our prayers kingdom-based? What's really happening there? Is it God make my life better and easier? Or is it God use my life to see the gospel advance? Just, just, just pray effectively. In light of this passage, how are we praying? Are we praying? And if we are praying, what are we praying? Pray effectively. This is the second thing. Do this. Think clearly. Perspective. Loved ones, think clearly. In light of this truth, in light of the world that we're living in, just think. Think. Get some perspective. What are we living for? Who are we? What's the point of think? What matters? It's amazing how little we think. Think clearly in terms of what Christ would want for my life. We're calling this perspective. One of the books that has helped me so much in light of the topic today is this one right here, Filling Up the Afflictions of Christ by John Piper. It's part of a biographical series he has done, and three people he does biographies on each time. This one is the lives of William Tyndall, Adoniram Judson, and John Payton. I have been so, I just reread it this week, most of it, so Blessed. It, it's one of those books where you just, you just see these lives giving themselves up for the cause of Christ, dying for it. And when you're done the book, you're just like, I don't know if my problems are really problems. I, I don't know if I got a passion for Christ at all. Because these guys, man, they, 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 like, they're so, like, I can all things as lost or passing worth. Like, again, they were living that out, and it's so humbling. You know, the bookstores run out, of course. I didn't even give them any really warning. But you can, get, you can download this and Desiring God for free. For free. I forgot about that. You're the first service to hear that. For free. And that's, it's excellent. Or you can order it. You know how to get it. Amazon, whatever. I, I just, again, I just, it's such a healthy discipline to just, you know, get out of our little lives and just look at some who just really live this stuff out. Think clearly. Thirdly, this. Um, live simply. Live simply. You know, um, that's just wisdom. Uh, our lives are so cluttered. Let me ask you this. Cluttered with what? I'm so busy. I'm so busy. Let me ask you. Busy with what? Honestly. I'm so busy. Doing what? At the end of the day, before Jesus Christ, Lord, I'm so busy. What were you busy with? Uh, uh, next question. Like, what a great prayer. Lord, what, what in my life is, has to go? What are the things that are so temporal that it's, you know, it's producing an inability to even pray in my life? Live simply. Next, give generously. Of course. What are you, what are you gonna give towards? Well, the things that matter, the gospel. Because there's urgency there. I can, I can store for myself all sorts of earthly things, but at the end, moth and rust destroy those. That means nothing. Give generously. Fifthly, this, love powerfully. The cost of self, suffering. See, love, love is undergirding all of this. Lord, use my life to love. I want to love. Less of me, more of Christ. Love self. Or love Christ, don't love self. Sec sixthly, this, believe expectantly. So, Part of what's happening today, too, is you're like, man, this is like, wow, well, it's hard. But, but I want you to understand that faith, faith overrides fear. And what faith says is like the baptism video. That's all happening in the midst of our world. God's at work, loved ones. He can't be stopped. You cannot stop Jesus Christ. The gospel is going forward. He, he's doing all this. I mean, it's, just, it's just, just, just wake up and smell the faith right here, okay? Because we can believe expectantly to say, in spite of all this, man, God can't be stopped next week. It's so exciting. And so I'm not going to fear. I'm going to have faith. I'm going to have faith faith and believe God wants to do that for your life as well.